All right. Uh, well, hello everybody. Give me a, a moment here to make sure that uh, the stream is actually working and that my audio is also working. But uh, I'll give some time for everybody to pop in here before I get started. But welcome, welcome everybody. Let me make sure that this is going out. And I'll give, I'll give some time for everybody to pop in here. Is my voice I... cool? All right, I'll mute that. <laughs> um, yeah, welcome everybody. Hope you're having a, a good day or a good night wherever you are. But uh, yeah, let's see here. I think that's everything. One more second. I guess I can check Twitch as well. All right, cool. That looks like it's working. Looks like my chat is maybe not uh, connecting here, but Runard, or Runard, welcome. How you doing? Un momento, por favor. Um, boo, boo, boo. All right. Doesn't look like my uh, Facebook chat is connecting, but I'll give that a second. And uh, if one of the uh, one of the live stream team is in here, maybe you guys know what to do here. Maybe Mordecai or somebody else knows. Uh, yes, I. <laughs> that's right. We're using red wax tonight. Thank you uh, for reminding me, Mordecai. Wow. Thanks for coming in here just to remind me. Hello. Welcome to the uh, red wax stream. <laughs> no, we're not going to be using red wax uh, tonight. Um, <laughs> let me turn all that back on and drop back to our, what were we on? Skin shade four, I think. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, I guess, uh, tonight, yeah, I know. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. No red wax. Uh, it's been a little bit. It's been, I think maybe, maybe a, a three or four weeks since the last time I was streaming on here, but, uh, yeah, I got some really cool stuff planned for tonight. I think, I hope, uh, I guess we'll find out together. <laughs> Uh, but yes, during our last stream on the channel, uh, we had started working on uh, this Goofy character, Gooby here. Uh, and since then I finished him, so this is kind of the finished uh, version of Goofy. And uh, he turned out pretty cool. I had a lot of fun working on him. And uh, if you guys are interested, so I worked on this actually on my own channel. There's a link somewhere up here at the top of the screen. It's Twitch TV slash Polygon with an underscore at the end of it. Uh, I did. I did just start. I just uh, just pressed play. And uh, welcome, side effects. Welcome back, I should say. Uh, but yeah, we worked on this on my own channel, uh, which uh, if you miss a stream on my Twitch channel, there's always... Uh, let me see here. You can go to my YouTube channel. It's just Folygon. There's a bunch of playlists here with a ton of different characters that I've worked on. Uh, but our most recent one, actually, as well, that I've been working on on my stream is uh, this gal here. And, uh, yeah, she's turned out pretty cool as well. So I'm doing a Witch for October over on my Twitch channel, having fun with that. Uh, but yes, we're not actually going to be working with either of these, uh, these cool characters for this stream. I know. But, uh, we're gonna be working on this guy right here. <laughs> this, uh, stupid little muffin, uh, Spongebob muffin. Uh, about, oh gosh, when was it? Let me check on the art station post here. Uh, five months ago. Okay, so five months ago, I spent a week or like eight days here making eight different muffins, and I just had people suggest different muffins, and I spent like an hour making uh, each one of these. Uh, thank you, Mordecainer, for sharing uh, sharing that link, by the way. Um, but yeah, each day. So we're gonna be looking at the uh, the SpongeBob one here, the SpongeBob muffin, and we're gonna be walking through the process of uh, how you can 3D print. A, uh, a muffin of your own. Not just a muffin, but uh, uh, a ton of different stuff. Here, let me open up just my face cam here. So this was one of the first little full color prints that I did. This is a SLS, full color sandstone through Shapeways. Uh, here's my little guy, my little Folygon, which is uh, my little mascot guy that I use for all my stuff. Uh, and then I just have like a ton of these on my desk. There's like Banjo-Kazooie, Pikachu, Totoro, Spyro, Lapras, Chewbacca. I mean, I can go through here and show every single one of these off, but uh, we'll be here for a while. So uh, instead of doing that, what I would like to do uh, is go through the process of how we can make one of those with one of your 3D models in ZBrush. I thought that would be a lot of fun. I forgot to start my timer. Let me do that because I don't want to run way over and then uh, get yelled at. <laughs> okay, so 
Uh, I think that's all uh, before we get started here. I think we're all good to go. But yeah, let's let's jump right in and uh, get going here. Uh, so we got our, our 3D Sponge Boy, our SpongeBob model. And uh, at this point, if we have a little bit of extra time, I'll, I'll show you guys how to do something else quite a little, it, depending on how long this takes. I think I think I got this timed right. We'll try to go for the two hours. If we have a uh, a little bit of extra time, I'll, I'll fill it in with something else. And uh, if, we, if we don't have enough time to finish all this, we'll finish it next week, next Tuesday at the same time. <laughs> Muffin Bob paper pants, yes. Um, what if you print it in color or you painted it? Um, uh, so we are printing in color. This this process is for how you can print your stuff in color. Uh, but yeah, you can, you can paint uh, something if you print it in black and white, depending on what material you print it in. For SLS sandstone, you're probably not going to paint that. You're not going to have a fun time. Let me delete my witch and delete my goofy goober here. Delete him. So we just got Sponge Boy here and we can get started. So the first thing you need to decide, well, I'll, I'll go ahead and say this uh, right off right off the bat. I modeled this with the intention of 3D printing it at some point in the future. So it's already somewhat set up to be watertight and uh, we can talk a little bit about some of that stuff, some of kind of the standard practices of 3D printing. And I guess uh, if anybody has any questions while I'm going through anything, don't hesitate to, to stop me. Feel free to ask any questions. And if I miss your question, uh, don't think I'm ignoring you. I probably just didn't see it, so feel free to feel free to spam me and just ask again until until I recognize you. Um, so the first thing we need to do is we need to set up the size of our 3D print. And I see a lot of people struggle with scale in ZBrush, but we got this little handy tool called the transpose line. And I guess just a quick note on 3D models and 3D modeling software in general. When we're talking about size and scale and everything else, it's kind of a it's kind of like this ephemeral thing, right? Because we're dealing with the digital world. It's not it's not all um, you know. This isn't exactly uh, this isn't exactly three inches tall. It's three units tall, right? So you need to decide here in ZBrush. Let's make sure our scale is set to one first. This is very important that this needs to be uh, set to one for when we export. But uh, let's go ahead and decide. Uh, that our units that we're measuring with our transpose line, if you don't know how to activate your transpose line, you just turn off your 3D gizmo up here. It activates your old school transpose. I like to use this a lot. Uh, but I'm deciding that units equal inches in ZBrush so that when I export this later, I will know how many inches tall and wide and deep this, uh, this little muffin boy is. So, uh, taking a look at our little muffin bob, muffin bob pants, I want to make him about half the size that he is right now. So the first thing I want to do is make him about, he's about 3.2 inches tall right now. I want to make him about 1.5 inches tall. So to do that, I'm going to open up Transpose Master and click on T-Pose Mesh. That's in your Z plugin menu. That's up here, Z plugin. If you guys haven't or uh, don't already, just take your Z plugin menu and I like to dock it over here for just easy access while I'm working on this process. I pretty much keep this stuff over here uh, the the entire time I'm working. Uh, but if there's anything, you know, like materials, for the most part, I keep just my tool menu over here on the right. But on the left, I'll throw, uh, throw a bunch of menus over there depending on what I need. Cool, so that like messed up our border in ZBrush for some reason, so let me re, re, uh, redo that, fix that up. Um, so yeah, now we're in Transpose, and we're going to scale our character down uh, to be roughly 1.5 uh, 1.5 units or inches tall. So we go into uh, geometry, so tool geometry, and then size. There's a size and a position uh, slider in here. You can mess with both of these. We're going to be messing with just size. And I want the Y height, or the uh, Y, which is the up and down axis here, to be uh, around 1.5. I did this earlier. We'll we'll mess with this and try to. I think it was like 1.8 something. 1.8. Uh, we'll just say 8 8 or around there. Cool. That looks right. Uh, so we are still in Transpose Master. I've just set my X Y Z height. Uh, messing with this slider uh, adjusts everything at once. But if you mess with only a specific slider. 
it will only work in that one dimension. So that's why I've adjusted this one with the intention of getting that Y height to be a little bit closer to what I need there. So after I've done that, all I have to do is click T-Pose Subtools. That'll go back to my SpongeBob model with all the individual subtools. It'll run through the list here as it's doing. And we'll start to scale down all of those to make the final character or muffin, you know, whatever, whatever the heck you're printing, to be um, to be 1.5 units tall. Uh, and the reason I'm making it 1.5 inches tall is because I've done this a few times, and at this point I know that this printing process can get pretty expensive depending on uh, how big and how much material you end up using. So. Uh, if, if we're talking like three inches, we could be talking maybe like $30, $40 for a print. So prints are calculated uh, on a few things. The main factor, of course, being volume and how much material you use. And by the way, if I did not mention already, we will be doing, we're setting up this 3D printing process uh, to go through Shapeways. Uh, I don't think I did mention this. Uh, I'm not, uh, maybe I did, I don't know. Um, but yeah, so, if you guys have your own 3D models and you don't have a printer, I mean, it's totally cool. You can use this uh, nice online service, shapeways.com. There are a few others like it, but I'm doing this specifically for Shapeways since I've done this in the past. Uh, this is my shop. It's just Shops Ben. Uh, but for example, you can see the render, what the 3D prints end up looking like in this full color sandstone material, which is what I was just showing off here with these two guys here. Whoa. So these are two different 3D models. You can actually uh, print multiple um, 3D files at once through one, uh, one whole shebang, one whole uh, shop product or upload. And when you upload something to Shapeways, you don't even have to put it on an, uh, an online shop. But, uh, so I know, I know from my experience that you know, anywhere between like a little bit under two inches is going to be a really good number to, to try to get around. And I'm sorry uh, for anybody that is watching on Facebook. I'll mention again, uh, I'm not I'm not getting your messages, and it looks like the chat messages actually aren't appearing here on screen either. So let me just toggle that off, and I will just I'm just going to pull this over here so we can see some of these messages. So let me try resizing that. Whoa, cool. All right. Uh, so 1.5 inches tall. Awesome. Let's just measure him, make sure. I'm just kind of doing a quick little measure here with my transpose line. That's what this number is up here. You can use your transpose line to measure all sorts of awesome stuff. Uh, it even snaps to vertices, which can be very useful, which we'll be looking at uh, a little bit later as well. Um, I'm... I'm actually gonna, I'm sorry, I'm gonna move this. It's very distracting for me. <laughs> I'm just gonna keep this off screen and I uh, I promise to, to read any messages that, that swing by. Um, but yeah, so a few things before we, you know, just dive right in. If you're printing in full color sandstone through Shapeways, there are a couple uh, limitations. There are some, some guidelines that you have to follow. In every material that you're gonna be printing in, whether it's FDM printing for PLA or, or ABS, whatever you're using, they're going to have different, uh, you know, guidelines, minimum thicknesses, all that that you're going to be able to uh, try to stay within. And I know that uh, my minimum thickness that I can hit for pretty much everything is going to be right around three millimeters for this. Uh, we're going to be doing some stuff to hollow out our print as well through this process. Uh, but with that, um, with that said, let's let's get in here real quick. So three millimeters, that's about uh, 0.12 inches, right around there. I try to hit somewhere between three to five millimeters, depending on what it is. If it's uh, unsupported, so something like this nose here, that's an unsupported uh, object, meaning that there's nothing, there's nothing really supporting it out here, uh, up to here. So this this super thin area where it connects to uh, to the face there. I want to make sure that that's probably about five millimeters just so it doesn't snap off really easily. I have one print back here on my table that ended up breaking just because, you know, I tried to push that uh, thickness a little bit too much. So the first thing I always do is take all of my uh, subtools here and let's, let's see, what is this? That's our one that we remeshed. Okay, so the first thing I do 
let's make sure I got the correct one here, is take all of my, my whole character and I go to Merge Visible. You click Merge Visible. Get all of those in one subtool, you'll see that we're at 8 million polys. And I'm just going to dynamesh this at the base resolution of 128. And that's really dirty. That's really messy. But what I will now do with this is I'll upload this to Shapeways and use that model as a guideline. And I've already done that. But before you ever upload anything that we want to 3D print, the first thing you want to do, uh, I'll, I'll show you guys where this is the first time. In the future, I'll be using my uh, hotkeys and menus for it. But down here in your display properties, there's this little button called Double. And what that allows us to do is see the inside of our mesh. So I can now come in here and look at this and make sure we're not having any uh, floating pieces. Because all of this is connected, it's what's called watertight, which we can maybe talk about uh, a little bit more in depth if anybody has any questions about that. But uh, essentially, this is it. I'll, I'll take this model. I'll export it, and I'll export it as an OBJ, and I will upload that to Shapeways. And I've already done that here, and uh, that is what this guy is. Let's see here. So this is 1.5 inches tall, right? And if we look down here at price, uh, it's reading $26. And actually, with the full color sandstone, that would be even more. So at 1.5 inches, we're talking maybe maybe even $30, but we're going to do some things to, to really lower that price and fix this. But you're seeing that it's not giving us a price here, and that's because uh, we need to check out uh, what our issues are exactly. And I have a, I have a pretty good idea. Uh, but if you, uh, to upload, I guess, just real quick, so you guys do know how to upload. Uh, let's see, where is where is my, my Shapeways? Oh, here it is. Uh, just click on this little icon. They recently updated their UI, so I don't I don't know exactly where everything is. Just click on upload, and you want to be careful when you do upload your 3D model. You want to make sure. So I'm printing in inches. I exported with uh, inches, so I'm selecting inches. Got desk toys, and then I'll just select my file and uh, upload that here. This one took uh, maybe like 15 minutes for it to calculate all this stuff. Normally it takes a lot longer, uh, but the reason it went so quick was because this was uh, so low res, so low uh, resolution. But yeah, let's click on View Issues and uh, see what's going on here. Why are, why are we having some issues? Uh, Dr. Pixels, welcome. Uh, are you going to hollow the model? We will, absolutely. Uh, we'll be doing a lot, of, a lot of different things here throughout this process. Uh, Sliffer, Slip. Slip, slip through. Oh man, I am terrible with names. Uh, for anybody that goes to my streams, you know how bad I am with them. Uh, so you can sell, no permission needed. Uh, no, I, w I, I would not uh, probably do something like uh, straight up SpongeBob model here. Uh, Gliffy, hello Gliffy, welcome. Uh, Engine X is also here, and uh, Alex as well. Welcome everybody. All right, so we got our Sponge Boy. Let's go to uh, our first warning. I'm not actually getting the, oh, there it is, the uh, texture warning. So we don't have any poly paint or uh, textures applied to this. We'll be talking about that a little bit later. But the wall thickness here is our big concern. And uh, this show heat map view is essentially telling us where we are good and where we're going to uh, experience some problems. So here in the mouth around these lips, it gets really thin. That's definitely a huge problem area. And then over in these eyelashes, we also get super thin. So we definitely want to avoid all of this junk that's going on. Uh, now, this is really dirty. It's like Dynamesh, really low resolution. So these aren't exact, but uh, this is a pretty good guideline for us moving forward. So this should help us out. Uh, and hello from Germany, uh, Ten Takomo. Welcome. Welcome to the stream. How are you doing, man? Uh, let's jump back into ZBrush now. So now we know a few things. We know that our lips are too thin, and we know that our eyebrows are uh, going to be a, another thin or problem area. Uh, another thing that we want to keep in mind, which is uh, a little bit more difficult uh, depending on what you're working on, but due to the limitations of Shapeways, we can only upload a model that is under 1 million polygons or under 64 megabytes. And uh, getting it under 64 megabytes, we'll do some zipping and stuff like that to uh, avoid having a, a pretty large file. But getting it under 1 million polys can sometimes be really difficult depending on uh, what, you're, what you're creating. 
So, uh, yeah, I think, let's see here. Let me make sure I got that set up. Cool. So I've done this already. Uh, we're gonna kind of run through this kind of cooking cooking show style where I like put it in the oven and take out a finished one. We're kind of gonna be, going to be doing that uh, a little bit for uh, speeding up some of this this process. But uh, here is my SpongeBob model, and you'll notice that my total points on all these sub tools are right around. We're looking at somewhere around eight million polygons. Uh, this is the vert count, uh, the total points. Uh, it's not an exact poly count, but you can use that as a pretty good rough estimation. Uh, so, one of the first things we uh, would like to do is start lowering our poly count. Lowering our poly count and also worrying about some of these areas where things need to be uh, thickened up. But let's worry about poly count first and then we can start fixing some of these different areas. So, poly count first, right? We have our top little sponge here. And does anybody know, I feel like a, I feel like I'm a, being a teacher now with this question. Does anybody know how to, a good way to lower poly count? Timmy, Timmy in the back, I see you, Timmy. You can put your hand down, what do you, what do you think, Timmy? Uh, I'll just, I'll, that was a little bit rhetorical. Uh, but what we're gonna do is take our subtool of our Sp SpongeBob head here I'm going to solo it, which means that everything is not visible except for this piece. I'm going to duplicate it. And then I'm going to go into Decimation Master. Ooh, ooh, three people beat me to it right as I was about to say it. I see you guys. Three, three Pac? Is that three Pac? <laughs> oh, God. Uh, and uh, Skizmage? Something. Side effects? Yeah, you, you, you guys know. You guys know about Decimation. Cool. Uh, well... Uh, for decimation, the, the process is always pretty much the same. Uh, you can pre-process all of your subtools at once. I never recommend doing that. I always have problems with it. But uh, pre-process current is probably the best way. You click that, it'll calculate your uh, 3D model. And after it's done calculating, now I've already done this uh, because it takes too long. I didn't want to do it on stream. So after you're done calculating, it'll, go, it'll give you a loading bar all the way across your screen. Uh, then you can click on decimate current and uh, typically I do percentage uh, and what I've aimed for is about 5% of my original mesh. So we're at 3.6 mil right around there and now we're getting down to like half a mil. Uh, actually, let's see, I do this a couple times here. So the final, I think the final number I choose is right around this 350 million number or so. Uh, let's see. Does this part join in the final test? Does this part join in the final test? There is a test at the end, uh, and you all be graded, absolutely. <laughs> uh, no, 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 we're absolutely not retopologizing this manually for 3D printing. Uh, God, that would be absolutely useless. <laughs> Topology does not matter for, for 3D printing at all, as long as it uh, holds the actual shape. So we've decimated this, and let's, let's get in here and look at what decimation does for those of you that don't know. Essentially, decimation will uh, lower the poly count as best as it can and apply polygons to an area where it needs it and take it away from where it doesn't. So this surface over here is a little bit more flat, but as we get into these curved surfaces, these uh, SpongeBob holes, you can see that we start getting a lot denser in the mesh. So as, uh, as we kind of build up uh, in form, if I were to sculpt on this and then redecimate it, it would apply more polygons to that area where I applied that stroke. Uh, after you're done with that, what you want to do is, uh, so we have duplicated this, remember that we have duplicated this. You want to have both of your subtools visible, as we do right now, and uh, I have solo mode turned on, and the reason I have solo mode turned on, I have a hotkey for that, my G key, what that allows me to do is just see the one that I want that, I'm, that I have selected. So it's a very, very useful hotkey. Uh, I recommend setting up something with Sola. So I'm just going to click on uh, Project here, and after that projects, it'll ask me if I want to apply poly paint. You want to answer yes to that, or yes always, one of the two, and then you'll get your poly paint projected on there. And after you have your poly paint, you can just delete that extra mesh here, this, this high res one that you projected your poly paint from. So projection is not just for geometry. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you guys know that, but uh, you can also use projection for poly paint. And we're actually going to be using our vert color here 
to uh, export this. If I did not mention, we're gonna be exporting as a verml, a VRML file. Uh, let's see. Uh, no UVs needed, yes. No UVs needed for printing in color. We can actually print with our polypaint data, our vert color. Uh, polypaint is vert color, it is not face color. That will be uh, very important later. Also, it will be on the test that you all will be graded on later. Um, okay, so we've projected that polypaint. Very cool. Uh, and at this point, uh, what I like to do, because for our final model, uh, to get the final watertight mesh, what we'll be doing is using live boolean. So, let's toggle on live boolean, make sure all our subtools are visible here, which they are, and just click on make boolean mesh. And the reason I'm doing this is because in total, we're at about 5 million polys, but we have a lot of stuff that's like going into each other and sitting on top of each other, so it's not an accurate uh, accurate number of what our poly count actually is. So by performing a live boolean, it will combine all this stuff, and then we'll actually get to see uh, what this what this mesh is looking like. What this um, several warnings. Oh no, <laughs> that's okay. That should not be a huge issue. We'll look at this. Uh, which one is it here? I believe this is it. Okay, so uh, I have performed my live boolean. You'll notice some weird things going on here in our teeth and in our eye uh, eyelashes. Uh, because we, in ZBrush, we use vert color, you can see that this red color from the mouth is pulling down into this tooth. And same up here on the eye uh, eyelashes. I keep wanting to say eyebrows. SpongeBob doesn't have eyebrows, does he? Oh well, it doesn't matter. Uh, you can see that the eye color is kind of projecting on there. So if I were to come here and paint on this, you would see. Oh, is it going to do it? Oh, I'm painting black. That's my bad. I meant to paint white. So as I paint on that vertice, this single vertice, it starts to gradate out through towards the, the rest of those polygons. So we definitely want to avoid that. But uh, what I'm seeing here is that we need to remove about 2 million polygons from here. We can also, while we're here, we'll turn on double. We'll cut our mesh in half and just look around in here. Ooh, okay. So these are definitely things that we want to avoid. Uh, this means that our mesh is not watertight. So uh, all these little floaters in here are very, very bad. We want to avoid all of that, that floating garbage. And uh, we will do that here shortly as well. So let's just delete this. This was just to uh, visualize how everything's kind of coming together. We'll go back to our, our sponge boy here. And let's see. Uh, for 3D printing with colors, the colors must be solid hard, hard edges or fall off, fall off is allowed. Uh, so a little bit of that gradation, a little bit of that fall off is, is allowed. You can also transition between colors. Uh, it does not have to be a, a solid block out color. But I would recommend for the uh, kind of best best possible effect, uh, your 3D print compared to what your 3D file is going to look like. Uh, this is not obviously SpongeBob. This is a Pikachu Totoro little guy here. But um, the colors aren't going to be exact. So if you're doing stuff with gradients and uh, if you're getting really detailed there with your textures, uh, you might have to order a couple tests before you get things to be exactly the way you want them to look at the at the end of the day. Um, let's see. Have you used Zscript for scaling? Uh, let's see. Out of the box scaling and geometry menu as you've done already. Uh, I have not, I have not. Uh, ZBrush and scale can be very finicky. Uh, and when I'm working in production, uh, especially when I'm trying to be very precise, uh, I make sure that everything, if I'm importing models from you know, if somebody else is like giving me uh, like any kind of base or, or anything else, or if I'm downloading something from online, I'm always making sure that my scale uh, slider down here is never never being affected unless I intentionally uh, want to change this. Uh, you might notice that this scale can get really out of whack as you import stuff in. Essentially, uh, if you're trying to measure stuff in ZBrush, if I set the scale to two, this should be about you know, three units tall now because it's multiplying that value by two. And if I were to export this, it would actually make it twice as big uh, to represent that that number that is being seen. But when you mess with your export scale, it doesn't actually, or I don't know if it still does, 
uh, but it didn't, I, I don't know if it still doesn't, but it didn't used to actually uh, modify your size constraints in your uh, X, Y, and Z sliders here. Okay, so let's fix a few things, right? We had uh, the poly paint messed up in our teeth. We also had the poly paint messed up in our eyelashes. And that is because these meshes are just cubes, you know, very low res. So we want to add some subdivs in here so that the poly paint isn't getting quite so stretched. We could also manually add some edge loops. That's totally fine, but I'm, I'm not super worried about it. So I'm just going to add some subdivision levels. And if I smooth this immediately, uh, you will see that we start rounding out. And you guys know how ZBrush works, probably. So you've probably seen this before. But we want to turn off our smooth, uh, smooth modifier here. So now when I subdivide this, it is still subdividing, but it's retaining that original shape. So I'll just subdivide that, you know, get a, get a few polys in there. The shape has not changed at all, though, because we have turned off that smooth modifier. I'll do the same thing for our eyelashes. But before I do that, I know that my eyelashes are too thin. Uh, one, because I've already tested this, but two, because um, from that little, uh, from this little test here, we can see that we're having a lot of problems in our eyelashes. So we could sit here and manually measure these in ZBrush. This is where stuff like that transpose line and vertice snapping can come in, uh, in great, great, uh, great hand here, be very handy. So we can just click and drag and snap between verts and we can see that that's 0.03 units or 0.03 inches. That's very, very thin. Uh, we want that to be at least 0.12 units or three millimeters. So 0.12 units being 0.12 inches. I can't make this super thick. Uh, I can't make it like, I, I can't make it point, uh, point 0.12 units thick because it would look absolutely ridiculous. Let, we can maybe see what that would look like. Let's see, point, point, uh, point 0.12. It's about that thick. So if we inflate this, those would be huge, right? I don't wanna, I don't wanna do that. I don't wanna completely make the character look uh, uh, so out of whack. What's going on, Shane? And uh, it, <laughs> have Mike, Brendan, and Folly going today. Well, sounds like a sounds like a productive day. <laughs> no, I'm, I feel like everybody is always working on stuff as they're as they're working on streams. Every day is a good day when you paint and sculpt. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so we can we can actually inflate this a little bit. The way the inflate algorithm works, it pushes out along the normal. So I'll be turning off that smooth modifier and dividing this a few times again so we can see what that looks like. If I inflate though, it's gonna warp this shape because it's pushing out along all the normals of these polygons. So I will inflate before I subdivide and that will stay as that perfect cube shape. And I think that's even too thick here. So we'll just do a little bit more. And then a little trick to get around some of these thickness issues up here is to taper it. Taper it from a larger to a smaller shape. So I'm going to run an auto groups operation. That's in your poly groups menu down here. Poly, uh, poly groups, auto groups. And then I'm going to just do a quick mirror and weld, which is in your modify topology menu. Geometry, geometry and modify topology. Uh, and I've done that so that I have uh, even poly groups here so that I can take one of these, mask it off, Mask off that back side. And you know what, actually, I think I could just do this for all of these at once, we'll see. I'll just mask all those, the backs, or actually, no, I did that wrong, sorry. The backs of those. And then we can use deformation inflate and inflate those back sides. And we'll get a little bit of taper coming forward from there. And we get a little kind of, little freak out over here so we can maybe, uh, let's see. Turn off our back face masking and just nudge that in a little bit. And I've already tested this, so I know that that's pretty good uh, in terms of getting that to actually successfully print. But if you guys want to do maybe make that a little bit more flush, these little thin areas can be very, uh, very problematic. Uh, it's just a matter of kind of testing it, sending it back and forth to Shapeways a few times until you get it to work. Uh, so our, our lips were also one of those kind of problem areas. So the way I would fix that is to use my move brush and turn on back face masking, which you can find in brush. 
Auto masking, where are you? Auto masking, back face masking. And let's see here. Uh, how much does it cost to make the 3D item? Uh, we'll be looking at that uh, as we go here. As I showed in the uh, first, first part here, this one, this terrible first 1.5 inch tall model was close to $30 for that, that hunk of junk. Almost, so 26 unpainted. If, that, if this was not uh, having any issues, it would be around $30. Go back here. Uh, but as we make some changes here, I'll show you how that price will change quite a bit. Um, so what do we got? What do we got going on? We got our teeth set up with some subdivs. We also want to put some subdivs in our eyelashes to make that hold its color a little bit better. And then we also had uh, some of those floaters in the inside of our mesh. So the way we can avoid that is by, I'm just gonna take this mesh here, and I've already kind of done this once, so I know that if I just scale this little slice up ever so slightly, really, like ever so slightly, that that is good enough to uh, close all those holes and make sure that we're not having any problems. I could also use my transpose line and give a little tug here with, uh, with move, you can actually stretch and scale stuff with your move transpose. It's very, very handy. Okay, so I have 1.8 million polygons in this slice alone. That's a lot. That's This alone cannot be printed on Shapeways. That's how high poly this is. So uh, what we would like to do is decimate this as well. So I'm going to hold the C key over this. That'll sample any color here in ZBrush, in the UI, in your subtools, in, uh, in everything. So I'm just sample that color, it's a little off-white. And I'm gonna click on pre-process current. And we're gonna do this twice, just so I can illustrate something really quick here. Three, three million dollars for a SpongeBob muffin, yes. <laughs> uh, yes, it absolutely depends on the model, the size, the scale, what type of material, uh, everything else here. Okay, so that is almost, like I said, I, I'm gonna, this is gonna be the only uh, piece that I pre-process on here for Decimation Master, just so I can illustrate this for you guys really quick. So once that's done, okay, cool. So I'm gonna decimate this, decimate current now. That's done decimating. And you can see that there's a, there's some stuff going on here, right? Um, on this flat surface, because it's flat, ZBrush will uh, essentially say anywhere where there's not detail, let's turn off that poly paint color, anywhere where there is not detail, it will have less polygons there. So it's getting kind of crazy in here, right? You know, a little crazy, but on the edges you can see that it's, it's added more. The problem with this is that these cause stretching uh, for colors. So around here on the edge, I'm going to get a lot of stretching going on probably, and I want to avoid that. So the way that I'm going to essentially trick Decimation Master, and this is just something that I've kind of figured out from doing this multiple times, is we're gonna use some noise, some very, very slight noise. So in uh, your surface palette, surface menu, tool surface, we can turn on noise. And I know at this scale that the default just noise settings right here are going to be good enough for what I need. So I'm just gonna click okay. And I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to click Apply to Mesh. And that is going to apply this very small noise. And uh, it, looks, it looks a lot bumpier than it actually is. I'll fill in the color here. It's just because the default noise actually adds poly paint as well. So I'll fill that in. And you can see that it's a very, very slight noise. At 1.5 inches tall, or even at, you know, at, if this was a foot tall, this, this, um, this texture would not come through. Um, so now what I've done is I've added slight bumps to the surface. So I'm going to reprocess this with Decimation Master. So it's going to reanalyze the mesh. And now when I decimate it, I'll show you what that new decimated uh, topology will look like. It will, uh, we'll, we'll give it a second here. 
Um, do you have a simple print from Shapeways sitting around a show? Yeah, for uh, yeah, I, I've been showing off a lot, and uh, I know some more people are like jumping in here. Uh, oh God, <laughs> I have a I have a crap ton of these, a uh, uh, bunch of different like little 3D prints here on my desk. Um, like literally, I cannot hold all of them at once. I don't think. No, there's absolutely no way. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight more that are not in my hands right now. Uh, this one is a fusion of a uh, Spyro and a uh, Lapras. Uh, this is Ganondorf from Wind Waker mixed with the Rito Bird Race from Zelda. Uh, I have a little Folygon here. He's my guy. Uh, but yeah, I got a, a bunch of. I got, I, got, I got a ton of these on my desk. We'll put all these back down. Okay, so that's done decimating. It should be. It is. Okay, so now oh, it's done uh, processing before I lose my pen. So let's click decimate current, and you'll see that the way this is decimated now, it's uh, maybe a little bit too low res, but ZBrush has said, oh, okay, so now there's all this noise in there, and I'm going to try to capture that with this decimation. I want the... Uh, so essentially by covering everything in this... Just basic noise, very small. It's uh, it's covered everything in even topology. It's really ugly topology, but it's maintained my shape. It's maintained my form. And uh, maybe it's a little bit too low poly, so I'll bump that up to 15% and redecimate that really fast. So that's kind of gone through there really quick. And then uh, on this piece down here, I've done the exact same thing. So I'll just step forward in my undos, and you can see how that one turned out. Still pretty dense, but uh, it, it'll be it'll be fine for our purposes here. The uh, the tie uh, didn't have any subdivision levels. Whoops, we went too far here. This tie didn't have any subdivision levels, so I've just uh, gone through and added some of those. Uh, those are great, thank you. Love the Spyro Lapis one, awesome. Just gave you a follow on ArtStation, thank you, man. Uh, Thanks for showing. They look awesome. You guys are you guys are all too nice. There, don't forget. You know, I, I might be I'm, I might I may be being nice right now, but there is a test at the end for all of you. So, those who fail uh, get banned from the Pixlogic channel. I was told from uh, Mr. ZBrush himself. I'm just totally kidding. Um, I I, <laughs> I wish there was a Mr. ZBrush. Uh, technically, there is, but. His name is not ZBrush. <laughs> um, cool. So we've we've gone through and we've decimated a few different parts. So at this stage of the game, what I would like to do, after decimating the uh, the bottom of the muffin or a few parts on the bottom of the muffin, we can um, we can re-boolean this. So with a live boolean turned on, we'll just click on make boolean mesh again. And you know what? I'm actually so surprised by how fast booleans are. Um, like compared to decimation master processing, live booleans are like sitting here combining and removing and subtracting like all these things, and it does it super fast. It's uh, it's pretty crazy. But yeah, it's like it's already done here. Here's this guy. Sorry, there was a, like a little preview of what's to come. We'll look at that in a little bit. Uh, okay, so now we're already down to under a million polygons. That's that's awesome. So I'm just gonna hide that that sidebar for now. Uh, the question is, though, are, did we get rid of our floaters? Are our little floaters on the inside gone? They are! They are gone! Yay! I always like to uh, we'll look at the more complicated area here in the face. It always trips me out looking at the, uh, the reverse of a character's face. It always, like, makes me dizzy. This one's a little bit easier to see. Oh, no, it's still, still, oh god, making me go cross-eyed. <laughs> um, cool. So, no floaters. Uh, let's look here at a few things. Uh, you'll see that there's some of that polygon, uh, or I'm sorry, poly paint stretching going on that I mentioned. A little bit is okay, but where it's a little bit worse off is uh, where two colors are blending together that are very, very different. So between this dark brown and this light brown, that's totally, totally okay. Those will, those will print without any problems. But between this really bright red and this white, these are small enough to where it's not okay. Sometimes, like occasionally though, you will, you'll get some like really bad projection. Uh, that is not okay. You want to avoid, avoid that as best as you can. Up here uh, between the black and yellow might be another problem area. This is uh, so minor though, it will not appear in the actual print. So I am, 
I'm not worried about that at all. So at this stage, we've got our SpongeBob here. He's under a million polygons. Yay, we did it. He's ready to go. At this stage, you could uh, you could just upload this and 3D print this uh, just fine, as long as you know minimum thicknesses and all that stuff is uh, is working out. Uh, Mr. ZBrush is my father. <laughs> yes, please call me call me Folygon. Uh, Doctor ZBrush could be a cool concept. I agree. Uh, <laughs> I will unban the followers of the Red Wax Army. Yes, we can. If we want, we can grab our Red Wax material here, uh, which which is just just beautiful. I love love me some Red Wax. <laughs> uh, I'm just using the Skin Shade 4 material, which I have not mentioned, I don't think yet. I recommend that when you're 3D print, or setting up 3D prints for full color sandstone SLS printing through Shapeways, that you do use um, Skin Shade 4. It's a very good material for just pre-visualizing how colors will come out, and it gives a pretty accurate representation of what those final colors will look like. Some of the other materials add uh, like, like post, post effects and different colors. Skin Shade 4 by itself is probably one of the uh, one of the better ones here. Okay, so I have actually uploaded this to Shapeways as well, uh, and it was good. It, it turned out great. It's a little dark and hard to see here, but it did pass. And uh, actually, this is after I think I've made even more changes. But you can see that the price has dropped significantly. Uh, this might be after I've hollowed this out, actually. So let's go uh, and take a look at hollowing out the model. And that will knock off uh, even more uh, because printing, um, with printing, you know, a lot of the cost is associated with volume. So making using less material, using less volume, is a, is a good thing. Is it gonna going to drop our price? And right now, because this is solid, uh, we are uh, going to have uh, all of this filled in with material and therefore take up a lot more material than we necessarily need. So, let's hollow this bad boy out. Have you uh, tried running a group loops to get a tighter, cleaner transition between the pieces? Uh, these are decimated, uh, and it's not about uh, getting a clean, uh, clean, I, I have used group loops a lot in the past, uh, but I have not tried it with this specifically, just because it's decimated geometry. Um, there might be, mm, there might be instead of just straight up um, using group loops, just because group loops is going to require obviously a poly loop, uh, we could hide everything and try to do a group loops around that. But what group loops does is it can you know change your actual shape. So uh, one thing you might be able to do, a different uh, solution, might be to take one of these edges and force it to have an extra edge loop in it by slicing it. Uh, let me turn off perspective. So by adding a little thin slice or two here, you can actually, by slicing, you are, you're actually adding uh, additional polygons. So you can see that it's added an additional edge loop there. So you could maybe use a uh, rounded slice or, or maybe you could you know, create some, some other kind of slice there to up that resolution even more. Uh, just to get some of that bleeding to go away. But like I said, this bleeding, uh, bleeding of this level is, is really not gonna affect affect anything. Uh, if I, all right, cool. Let's see here. So let's hollow this, uh, this SpongeBob out. So how do we hollow them out? Uh, the way that I do it, uh, I think there there's gonna be, well, there are two uh, very prominent ways off the top of my head. But um, we're gonna do it. We're gonna do it through creating an actual subtractive piece. So we're gonna duplicate our SpongeBob muffin here. I'm gonna turn on solo mode so I can only see that. I'm gonna turn off my poly paint just so I can see what's going on here. And what we're actually going to do is just dynamesh. Well, we're just gonna dynamesh this. And the reason we're dynameshing this is because, let's go back to our SpongeBob here. We know from our Shapeways page here that our minimum wall thickness should be right around three millimeters, which happens to be about 0.12 inches. So I can use my transpose line or measure with something else if I have a piece of geometry. So what I'll do is I'll 
click on the bottom of my mesh, that'll snap to that, uh, that, that face of that polygon. And then I'll just hold shift and drag my, whoops, try that one more time. Hold shift and drag my little line up here. I'm looking at the top left corner, trying to get around 0.12 units there. So that's about, uh, that's about three millimeters, this distance. So with that, I'm going to use deformation. I'm gonna turn on transparent here so we can see this inside. And I'm going to deflate this until it's within this uh, three millimeter limit here. So you could scale, you could absolutely scale this in, but that doesn't always work for all objects. Uh, it's not gonna work for, it might work a little bit better for something like this, but for uh, something where you have like a U or an arm, if you try to scale in an arm all at once, it's going to pull in uh, and outside of the mesh and it won't be even. So we're gonna be using deformation inflate or deflating it because that operation works along the normal. So I know that if I pull this inflate slider back 100 units exactly, or maybe even a little bit more, normally it's right around 100, uh, this will reach that three millimeter line at this scale that I'm working on. But if we look at this, that's, uh, that's a whole lot. That's, that's, a, that's a big mess. Uh, so we're gonna do some stuff to make this not happen quite as bad. And we're also going to have a little bit of that, but we're gonna, we're gonna clean it up here. So, uh, let's see here. <laughs> Maybe going to bed would be cool. Going to bed sounds awesome. Um, uh, remesh by union is a great new feature. Uh, I, uh, I love me some Dynamesh, I really do. Uh, hollow it out as well. Um, I do not use remesh by union too much in my own personal workflow. Maybe I should experiment with it a little bit more. So anywhere where there's all these hard edges, I'm just going to smooth all of these out. Anywhere where uh, these, these holes in the mesh are, I'm gonna smooth all these out. So all this stuff, uh, this nose, when I inflate this or deflate that, it explodes in on itself. So I'm just gonna take this nose and chop it off, not with my slice brush, but let's uh, control shift select, select lasso, destroy our nose, delete hidden. And I'll just re-dynamesh that and continue to clean up all these areas. So anywhere where there are sharp transitions, again, here on the tie, all this stuff can just be smoothed in really roughly. Our objective is to just get rid of a lot of this, a lot of this additional form. I want this to be a relatively smooth surface by the time I'm done with it. And to make that a little bit easier, I'll drop my dynamesh resolution as I go. And let's drop that even more here. We'll continue to Dynamesh all that out and just smooth this. And the reason I'm using the smooth brush, well, one, it's helping to uh, normalize this surface, but also two, the smooth brush, if you guys know, uh, as you use a big, strong smooth brush, it actually starts to shrink uh, your surface or your model in on itself. So I've deflated this, or I'm going to deflate it by three, uh, three millimeters, but also getting like this little extra pull in here in a lot of these areas can be very helpful for, um, for fixing a lot of these areas uh, and making sure that we're not too thick. So we'll continue to do that. And uh, once we're feeling like the surface is looking pretty smoothed out, pretty normalized here, we can maybe Turn off transparent or turn back on our other model with transparency to see what that looks like, and then we can uh, deflate this in on itself here. And we will still get some issues. Let's see here. Hazem, welcome to the stream. Uh, remesh by union is live boolean without boolean. So remesh by union, uh, uh, by the way, uh, a very similar uh, thing used to exist. I, I never used it. But uh, with an insert mesh and an open face, you could actually just control click and drag and it would actually stitch those, those pieces of, of geometry up. Uh, remesh by union from what I've seen uh, does that, but even better if you have overlapping stuff, which is, which is pretty cool. Um, okay, cool. So let's now deflate this all the way. So I'm looking to get that top edge to meet up with that about three, three millimeter line that I made. And you can still see we got a lot of uh, meshes that have deflated and flipped in on themselves. That's totally cool. What we're gonna do is Dynamesh. Dynamesh them, and then I'm just gonna sit here 
and very quickly erase those out with my smooth brush. And you'll see we'll get some holes, we'll probably get some floaters. That's not a big deal, but Dynamesh should take care of most of that. And uh, we can use an, uh, a pretty low res. I'm not just using the smooth brush here, I'm also using uh, the smooth alternate brush, or the alternate, uh, or I call it the normalize smoothing function. I don't really know what it's called, but it works kind of as an averaging of, uh, of your mesh a little bit. Uh, so if you start smoothing, let go of the shift key and continue smoothing. I'll use that as well. Down here, I'm going to have to cut this off at that line, so I'll just use my slice curve brush and draw out a line there, cut that off, and voila, there we go. So now we can turn that back on and see how that's looking, our uh, little de-inflated mesh that we've made on the inside of our SpongeBob. So at this point, uh, we're pretty close to being done, but we need, uh, we can't just have that hollow in there. Well, I guess we technically can, but uh, it's not super helpful. We need that material to be able to escape. So what do we make? We gotta make an escape hole. And the best place for an escape hole, I think, on our muffin is just gonna be on the bottom uh, where it's not gonna be seen. So for an escape hole, what I like to use is just a cylinder. So I will duplicate this so that I can drop a cylinder in here really quick. And let me see here. All right, making sure I didn't miss anything. Uh, you going to sleep, will rewatch this later. Not a problem, side effects. You have a good night and uh, go get some rest. <laughs> Um, uh, yes, you can also make there. I think they actually made a smooth stronger. Is, am I wrong? Or there, there, there's a there is a way to make your smooth brush uh, a lot stronger though. Yes, if you need to. Uh, so let's uh, let's insert a cylinder here. I'm actually going to insert a custom cylinder that I've made. I just call it a creased cylinder. I'm just going to insert it in the middle here. This is just a custom mesh that I've added to the IMM Primitive Brush, and uh, it just has creased edges so that when it subdivides, it, it's already creased and ready to go. Uh, the way you do that, uh, set up that those creasings a really quick way, is to hide your caps like that, go into Crease, crank that up to the, as high as it goes, and click on the Crease button. And uh, that will make sure that all those edges crease. Okay. So now what we want to do is make sure that this is going all the way up into that mesh and also making sure that it's just coming out on the bottom. That's about it. So let's see, that is in fact working out pretty well. Now uh, I won't pull up the, um, the page here, but I know from my experience that this, uh, this hole on the bottom, this escape hole, they typically want it to be about a quarter of an inch in uh, in depth or uh, in diameter. Sorry, not depth, but uh, diameter. Whoops. We'll go to the face cam here. So if we look on some of these, you know, we can see some of these escape holes on the bottom. Uh, but in some some cases, like my Chupaca here, these escape holes on his feet are much smaller than a quarter of an inch. I think they're an eighth or even under an eighth of an inch. Uh, it's okay if you uh, make it a little bit smaller because you can't make it larger. Uh, you just have to add additional escape holes to make sure that uh, that material is going to be able to get out of there. Uh, so if, if you have something that is smaller, it's, uh, it's not the end of the world, just as long as you're, you're creating multiple escape holes. But for this, I'm only going to need one. I'm just going to scale this up. We can do a, a quick, like, rough measurement here. That's about half an inch, uh, and that's totally fine. So I'll just put that about in the middle there. And I will hide my, my sponge boy here. And I will add some subdivs to that cylinder. And I will just merge these down, merge down. I'm just gonna dynamesh that again. And I'm totally fine with uh, keeping this rough. This is the inside of our mesh. This is gonna be used as a negative subtraction piece. So this doesn't need to be super clean and super pretty. If you do wanna make it uh, a little bit nicer, you can just do a quick Z-remesh uh, Z on it. I'll just do the default 5K uh, remesh and then maybe add some subdivs in there. And now I would subtract this, uh, but you know, we don't want to subtract it as is. It's, uh, it's way too high poly and that'll push us over, over our polygon limit of 1 million polygons. I also need to show you guys, 
something here after I decimate that. So that's decimated. We got our SpongeBob here. We have live Boolean turned on if we hit the little negative there. Boom, we got that subtracting out of there. Nice and neat. What we can do, what I like to do is pick the color that's uh, going on down here. And uh, maybe you might need to polypaint this if you have multiple colors or textures going on. But now our negative piece will uh, we'll fill that in just to make sure that that's subtracting correctly. Sometimes I'll make it, uh, I'll make it black instead. If you guys want to make the inside of it black, I'll just keep it brown for now. Uh, but yeah, let's, let's now run our live Boolean and uh, subtract that. So Boolean make Boolean mesh. And uh, as that subtracts, well, it shouldn't take very long at all. But once that's done, we'll get a look at our hollow and see how that turned out. All right. And here we go. So to check this, I will turn double on and we'll just slice this boy in half. And now we can see how this has been hollowed out. We have our cylinder subtracted from the bottom up into that uh, negative buck or that negative uh, subtool that we created inside here. And we can see how that's uh, fitting in with uh, this pretty well. In some of these areas, it seems like it maybe gets a little bit close here, but uh, I, think it, I think it'll be okay overall, especially since I've done this once already and I know that it, <laughs> I know that it works. Okay, uh, let's see, we're still under a million polygons after that subtraction that actually adds polygons. Subtracts form, but it adds poly count because we've added more uh, geometry in here. Uh, when you do, uh, I also recommend polygrouping everything before you export this. Um, let's see here. I think, I think that's good. Okay, so let's, I'm going to append Actually, let's, here, I'm gonna delete all of that and delete this, just so we can go back to the one that I made earlier that I know for certain does work. So uh, this is exactly the same thing here. I'll just show you guys here. So cut out, same subtractive thing. I just made this right before I jumped on stream just to make sure that everything was working. Uh, but for exporting, so Control W, that will polygroup anything that you have uh, masked. Let's see, turn off line. Uh, but if you don't have anything masked, it will just polygroup visible. So it's a quick little feature, quick little hotkey, Control W, polygroup what you uh, what you got on screen or what's in your subtool. Uh, now to export this with polypaint and everything else, we will open up our 3D print hub. Uh, let's go ahead and toggle off, we'll let that quick save, finish quick saving. Toggle off perspective here, and I'll look at my size. Uh, it looks like my Y size, it maybe got a little bit taller during, during some of my process here. Oh, maybe not, maybe not. Oh, that's because I rotated this, that's right. I rotated this because I think Shapeways has a uh, Z up axis. So my Z should be 1.5 around there. So in your 3D Print Hub, choose your size ratio and click on Update Size Ratios. You'll choose the option that you want here. Mine is this one here, 1.5 inches in the uh, XYZ. There you go. And then all you have to do is export as a VRML, VRML file. Uh, when you do this, though, it'll it'll pull a, uh, I guess, export VRML. Save. Okay, it'll pull up this weird menu here. Click, uh, click escape or cancel if that comes up. What you need to do is you, you it will try to export all your subtools here. So just copy your tool, paste your tool, and then uh, delete, delete other, okay? And that'll delete everything except for your subtool that you have selected. Now when you click export vermal, you can call that test, click on save, and it'll export correctly. Uh, but I've already exported that. So let me show you guys here. Where is my Windows Explorer? Okay, cool. So uh, I have a couple test prints in here that I've exported. This test print three is our hollowed out SpongeBob. Uh, but with our test print three, you can see that it's way over 64 megabytes, about twice of that, uh, twice that. 
under a million polygons, which is great. So I've just zipped that up. I use seven zip, so just right click. I have seven zip installed. Uh, and then zip that up and we bring that down to about 21 megs. And then from there, it's as simple as going over to Shapeways, clicking on uh, our little 3D model upload here, inches, select your file, select your category, upload that. And for something like this, so this one took like 15 minutes to calculate. This one took about an hour. Uh, and we can see here in the full color sandstone options, it is past everything. And I've brought it down instead of what we were looking at earlier, which was about $30. This is about, you know, right under $14 for the uh, standard full color sandstone price. So, uh, that's with a uh, minimum thickness all around of about three millimeters, which is uh, pretty close to the minimum. I like to make sure that uh, I'm just making sure that I'm fitting within that. Sometimes I'll try to go a little bit thinner if the price is way, way higher if we're getting up in the 20s and stuff. Uh, it just kind of depends. Uh, but then there's a little button over here. It'll say, you know, sell this 3D print if you guys have something that you're trying to put on a shop. It looks like it's maybe not going to it. Oh, I have it open already. And then there's a bunch of settings that you can set up and it'll uh, have you select your axis, uh, generate renders, and uh, you can choose your angle and everything else and, and click that. And then you're pretty much, uh, pretty much all set to go. So jumping from $30 on this hunk of junk to uh, 13 was quite a jump. But, um, and we got rid of all those issues with thicknesses and everything else, but um, yeah, that's that's about it. Um, from here, you could uh, order one, and what happens when you order a print on Shapeways, it'll go through a testing process uh, where they will attempt to print it on their end, and if there are any issues during that process, they will, they'll come back to you and let you know that either it failed or it passed. Pretty much after I've got through all the automatic stuff, I've never had a print come back failed, so. They, they'll shoot you an email in depending on how how big their load is currently you know maybe a couple days at the at the most I think the the longest I had to wait was like I think like Christmas last year around around December or January and I had to wait like a week before I got the uh, the go ahead on it sometimes shipping takes a little bit longer but overall it's a pretty good service I like it a lot and uh, I use it for uh, a ton of little things here. Uh, what's the advantage over STL? Uh, Vermals carry uh, polypaint color, vertex color, and they are uh, the only thing that you can use uh, for Shapeways to accept polypaint or um, vert color. You can also, um, I can't remember the other file format that you can use, it's like X something, X2, or I, I can't remember. But Vermal is our option in ZBrush that works and uh, also works in, uh, in um, Shapeways and it carries vertex color, which is awesome. Uh, pretty stellar, love it, awesome. Um, let's see, Shapeways can 3D print in color? It absolutely can, yeah. Um, 3D printing black and white only? No, 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 no. Uh, let's see here. So here's my, my shop. We got banjo kazooie, spiral lapras, a little cactus guy, uh, all sorts of all sorts of cool cool little three D prints. I think Pikachu Totoro and uh, banjo kazooie mixed with Angry Birds are are some of my favorites. But um, I'm also I'm actually uh, so over on my channel. There's a link somewhere up here at the top of the screen to my Twitch. It's Polygon underscore. Uh, I'm looking for suggestions for uh, another like three D fusion or or something to sculpt next. Uh, here's, uh, here's Fox McCloud with Space Dandy. Uh, but yeah, there's you know a lot of these that I've played around with and, and 3D printed in full color sandstone. And depending on, uh, I just have the natural full color selected, but there are a few new options that they have. So there is a glossy and a matte coating that you can get, but do be aware that those uh, jack up the price quite a bit. Um, this is not just like a, oh, it's always, you know, like $6 to add this coating. Uh, it's it, all of these additional, um, like coatings or, or different material changes, uh, are all based on like volume and, uh, uh, room in the print, like how much room it's taking up in the printer and, and everything else. And then there's like, you know, a ton of, maybe we could print this in a 14 karat gold, uh, SpongeBob. That would be awesome. Or just 
why would we gold plate it when we can we want this thing to be solid gold spongebob wow that would be the best seven thousand dollars i've ever spent is platinum okay platinum 25k is that the most expensive material that they have i guess i guess so i wouldn't think that brass or bronze or anything else i would have i didn't know platinum was more than gold but i guess it is oh or wait 18k 10k 25k so yeah that's about it there's the full color sandstone the whole the whole kit caboodle the whole thing we got about 45 minutes left so i do have something else that we can do here um uh, let's see um make sure i didn't miss any of these comments here questions all right i think we're cool so uh with all that I will move on here to showing you guys how to make a cool uh, little extra time lapse here at the end. Uh, I don't see a lot of people do this style of time lapse, uh, but let's see. I'm just going to kill ZBrush. That's right. We're just going to close it, and then I'm going to open up something else here. Uh, SpongeBob. I got a ZBrush project file here that I'm going to open up. So let me just kill ZBrush. Die, die, go away. All right, uh, here's my undos file. So pretty much the only time I save ZPRs or ZBrush projects is when I'm trying to save undos. It's very rare that I would um, save as a project for any other reason. Anytime other than that, I'm saving as a Z tool, just because the file difference there is about 10 times uh, different in size. I'll also mention, you know, while this is loading up, it's going to take a minute. Um, if you guys like the free content that you're seeing here and uh, some of the free content that I do on over on my Twitch channel, uh, I, I would greatly appreciate it if you checked out my Gumroad page. Well, what's going on here? Uh, I got I got some cool tutorials, some cool courses over here. Uh, I recently uploaded my base mesh for the. Uh, the witch character that I'm working on over on my Twitch channel. I've been working on a spooky witch for October. Not very spooky, obviously, if you look at this. Uh, so I uploaded that recently. It's just a few bucks if you guys are looking for a new base mesh or anything. Uh, like I said, uh, most recent course, Sculpting Appealing Female Faces in ZBrush. That looks like that's about done. Or it is done. Uh, but yeah, check it out. It's uh, follygon.com slash gumroad. I would greatly appreciate it. Even if you don't plan on buying anything, just give it a look season. and... Uh, if you can, I would always appreciate a share. All right, cool. Well, let's jump in and uh, show you guys how to do a Folygon style time lapse here. This will be a lot of fun. Sponge boob as the muffin. Oh, and the, for those that are, I guess, just joining us at the end, we've just finished going through the entire process of how to 3D print in full color, how to prep your, your characters and models here in ZBrush, and uh, send them over to Shapeways. This muffin. I guess for a lot of you that are maybe just jumping in, uh, <laughs> uh, about uh, five months ago, I, I took like a week and I made a, a more, I called it the morning muffin. And I just made a muffin uh, off of a bunch of different characters that people, people suggested. So uh, somebody suggested SpongeBob and uh, this is the monstrosity that we ended up with. <laughs> so our, our 3D prints already set up, that's all done. So uh, if you guys are joining us late, uh, the, uh, the streams here, uh, on the Pixelogic channel, wherever you're watching, uh, these do get uploaded to the Pixelogic YouTube channel after uh, after this is all over. So I think they go up like within 24 or 48 hours after the the streams are done. Uh, but yeah, check it out if you guys uh, if you guys missed anything, it'll be up there in a little bit. Same goes for my uh, my channel as well. Uh, over on my YouTube channel, I upload everything over there too. Um, cool. So. A Folygon style time lapse. How are we going to do this? Well, first of all, you can't create a time lapse without uh, either recording the process from beginning to end, or, or or you have what I do have what I do have here. Wow, <laughs> what I have here, which is my undo history. So I can scroll through my undo history as I uh, created this all the way back from this primitive cylinder shape here. So I started off with a cylinder and just sculpted that up, added some creases, got that up, adjusted the shapes, did some negative uh, booleans, I think, and uh, did that with all my different subtools here. So 
I'm going to just set this down here so this is a little bit easier so I can access my mouse and keyboard. The first thing we need to do is uh, set up our document for, for, um, for our recording process. I guess pre, pre that, uh, alpha would be uh, making sure that you have something with undos. So the way you do that, by the way, is up here, file, undo history, just check that. So the next time you go to file, save as, if you're saving a project, you can save your undo history. I save with Z tools 99% uh, of the time, except when I want undo history. So normally I'd be clicking this button, but uh, for this type, we'd be doing the, the file save as. So let's, uh, let's look here at setting up our document. So I'm just gonna go to document, toggle off pro, and I'm gonna set this to 1920 by 1080, which is just standard uh, standard high, high HD, high HD. <laughs> Let's resize that. So resize, yes. I'll clear my canvas, which by the way, if you ever lose the hotkey for that, it's just up here, layer clear. And then I'm going to go and dock my movie palette over here on the side. I'm going to toggle on my timeline so I can see that. And I'm gonna zoom out my document just a tad. If you wanna change your document's background color as well, so if you want to change that, you can just click this back button here and that'll set that. Sometimes what I do, because that's very bright, uh, I, I will set it to a bright green so that I can key this out later in Adobe Premiere. Um, but we'll just, you know, we'll just do a kind of a mid-tone here. That's fine, I think, for our demonstration. So I'm just gonna press the F key to frame in, and I'll just position this about, about here. And it might look a little pixelated. Uh, it actually isn't. That's because our document is, uh, just because of our document here, it's not exactly lined up where it should be. So some things can look uh, a, little, a little pixelated here, but keep, uh, just know that, that we're all good, we're cool. <laughs> uh, let's, let's click up here on our timeline. That's why we activated that. So that if we move this around or do anything with this, I can just click and drag on here and that'll recenter everything. You might wanna mess with your perspective settings too. I'm just gonna keep the perspective settings where they are. This should be, this should work uh, just fine here. So what is a Folygon style time-lapse? Well, uh, let's see if I have any quick uh, examples. I know I have a few on my Instagram here. Uh, let's see here. Maybe this guy. I don't think this should have any sound. Hi, I'm following. Oh, it does. All right. <laughs> we'll find one really quick. I know I have. Okay. So just having a time lapse, essentially where uh, the only thing that's, uh, nothing's moving, just everything is kind of piecemeal being jumped up uh, on your model here as everything gets put together really quick. This will work a little bit better for something that's uh, facing, facing our camera. Uh, much like this is. So the first thing we want to do is go to title image and overlay image, drag both of these sliders down. This is going to keep from any uh, extra logos or fading effects to happen. And then we can minimize those. And then the uh, next thing we're going to do is go to modify. And uh, it's been a minute since I've done this. So let me, let's make sure that we do this right. So spin frames should be all the way down to one. Spin cycles should be on zero. And then I believe H position, H size, and I think all of those need to be set to zero. Maybe one of those doesn't, doesn't matter. I'm just gonna set them all to zero. We're gonna test this really quick to make sure this works. Like I said, it's been a minute since I've done this. But once you have everything set up, you're gonna take your sub tool, scroll all the way back here on your undo history, and uh, we'll make sure that we're doing a large document. So this is recording at 1920 by 1080 here. And then I'm just gonna click on uh, F history. So this is forward history. So if I click that, it will start to calculate and run through my entire undo history, recording all these changes that I've done without moving the camera or moving the 3D model. So the 3D model is only moving uh, when I have, uh, you know, transposed it or actually moved it with anything or scaled it or sculpted on it or done anything to that, to that degree. So after that's done running through, 
We'll give it just a few more seconds here to play out. Let that, let that finish as I take a drink here. But once that's done, I have uh, I've activated solo mode so that we can only see uh, what's on screen. We will toggle things off kind of uh, in stages as we go through everything. Another thing that you wanna make sure that you don't do while you are recording your history or recording in general with this type of time lapse is you don't wanna drag your mouse across your document. Occasionally it can record the cursor uh, going through there. So you don't want that to happen. Uh, but that looks like that is just about finished. Give it a couple seconds there. And that is done. So let's just turn on uh, a couple more. We'll just like run through these and essentially just toggle them on one at a time and uh, go through the history for each one. So you can also choose the order that you want this stuff to appear in. So maybe next I'll, I'll start with my eyes. So I'll scroll back here, click on F history. We'll get that. And that'll just run through those. That, and that has you know very few undos. So really the heavy one is just this big one that uh, the, main, the uh, main part of the muffin that I spent all that time you know, subtracting booleans and everything else from. But uh, once that one's done, I think uh, we won't do any more. Uh, but then you run through all your subtools, you kind of repeat that process, uh, turning on one subtool at a time, recording through your forward history. And then after you're done, after you're done with all that, if you want, you can save your movie. It'll save a ZBrush movie file if you ever, for any reason, need to load it in and uh, or pause in the middle of your recording or pause in the middle of um, uh, you um, making some undo or recording your forward history for your undos. You can save that out. I pretty much just always export it so I have the video file. So we'll just click on export and I will just dump this somewhere. We'll just call it test and I'll click save and uh, it will run through uh, and calculate all that for us. But we only have, we've only done this to two sub tools so it should go you know, relatively quick. But after you're um, done doing this entire process then you'll have the uh, full thing kind of compile and we'll look at a couple more uh, finished versions of some stuff that I've done in the past. I think I've done this uh, I think I have already made one of these for the SpongeBob Muffin. So we'll look at, or actually, I did one slightly different, I think, for our SpongeBob Muffin. So we'll look at that as well. So that has exported. So now if you want to take the video file, edit it in uh, like Premiere or uh, Vegas or whatever your video editing software of choice is. Uh, personally, I like using Adobe stuff, but uh, you know, whatever floats your boat. Uh, let's see here. Now I should have a finished version somewhere might be, let's see, time-lapse. All right, so this one's a little bit different. Uh, with this one, I did not uh, change the settings to keep everything held in the same place. Uh, there are, I think I have, let's see, let me see if I have these settings here somewhere close at hand. So I have some video settings that I use on occasion to uh, keep the model in the center of the screen while also rotating around and having uh, this kind of effect here, which is pretty uh, nice. It'll be a little bit more um, apparent as more stuff gets added on there. But uh, yeah, uh, this one, like I said, it's not doing the thing where it's all just all in one place. So this is the same process, exact same process of running through the forward history. Uh, this one's a little bit more jittery though. Uh, it just kind of depends on how you're gonna set it up. There's some other settings that you can mess with to uh, make these a little bit less jittery and play around with uh, some of these other other settings here. But yeah, cool little, cool little simple time lapse. It's freaking out there a little bit with uh, VLC. But uh, yeah, so that's that. Let's see here. And again, if anybody here is tuning in a little bit later over on the Facebook uh, stream, I will check the chat over there to make sure I haven't missed anything. Um, let's see here. Because I, I, my, uh, my chat's not connected to that for some reason, and I apologize for that. Video and audio keeps dropping. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I haven't, 
Uh, please, uh, if you guys are having some issues with viewing over on Facebook, uh, go over to twitch.tv slash pixelogic and uh, watch over there. Uh, what are you making? Uh, so we didn't actually make anything uh, for this for this uh, stream. Well, technically, I guess we did. We made a 3D print, or we prepared our model for 3D printing. Uh, and we can, I guess, for people popping in here a little bit later, jump on over here to Shapeways. What started off as a 3D print of uh, SpongeBob very low res having a ton of issues. This would be about $30, I think we said. It was, it was around 26 unpainted, should be around 30 if it was textured and painted. Still has a ton of issues. Um, yeah, so we got that down after we hollowed it out and uh, did everything else. It looks pretty good. Uh, we got it down to about, you know, around $14. $14. Uh, and again, I'll mention that if you guys missed anything here, um, it will be up on the uh, Pixelogic YouTube channel after this. I guess we still have some extra time. I didn't think I'd go through it so quick. I guess we can just hang out now and do some other stuff. I don't have anything else planned, but uh, I can show you guys some other uh, characters that I've been working on, some other stuff. Let's uh, let's open up. Do, do, do. I just posted a, a couple screenshots of this gal online right before I started streaming. Let her load up here. Turn on live boolean. So this is a concept of uh, of D Dino's creation over on ArtStation. This is Domino from Deadpool. And uh, yeah, I'm pretty much done with this gal. I want to do a render. Like I said, I just posted some screenshots of her online. She's pretty cool. I had a lot of fun working on her. Uh, we have a lot of other stuff here that I can show off. Over on my Twitch channel, I've been working on... And let me know. Let me know if you guys have any questions about... Uh, anything that you're seeing, any uh, any of the process, or how'd you make anything, or uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know, any any, any questions. <laughs> if I don't know the answer, I'll I'll just make something up, and we'll all have a good laugh. Uh, let's see here. This is the uh, witch that I'm working on over on uh, my my Twitch channel. Uh, like I said, ooh, we can update that. Maybe we can work on this for a little bit, but um, she's not done. She's not finished. Let me pull this in so I can actually move and rotate around here, and I should turn my uh, chat on. I like the negative space. Talking about Domino here. Yeah, she's uh, she's really cool. I sculpted that negative space so, so long, so hard. All this negative space. That was the hardest part. No, it's actually true. Uh, getting a lot of the silhouette to read is very difficult. Uh, and that's mainly because her legs, her arms, and everything else are are different shapes. So this pose is insane. Uh, it, it was very hard to um, to sculpt the, a, a character in this pose, and that's why uh, most of it was done asymmetrically. Uh, I did a little bit symmetrically in the beginning, just for some quick block out for a little bit of proportions. But a lot of stuff uh, you know, we can you know we can look at D Dino's original concept as well. Um, let's see if I got it handy. Whoop, we'll find it really quick. Here's the original concept. So things are um, things are pushed like crazy in this. Uh, looking at the, looking at a lot of things. If, you, if even just like looking at the arm and how pushed some of this stuff gets, the fingers are different shapes. Uh, there's a lot of crazy stuff going on in the knuckles down here, so I've made some uh, some changes uh, where where I thought things maybe got a little bit too asymmetrical, but for the most part, uh, we've we've stuck to it as best as we could. Uh, but yeah, really really crazy pose, really really crazy uh, pushed pushed super far character, uh, but it was a lot of fun to work on. Uh, turned out great, fun character. Yeah, it's a it's a really really cool character, really cool concept. Definitely uh, go check out D Dino on ArtStation. That's D I N N O. Um, let's see. And I'm just gonna I'll leave that there. And then this this gal 
is what I'm using on uh, on my, my current Twitch stream, my current progress. This material up here is actually the uh, jelly bean material. What I like to do for gemstones or uh, any kind of like, uh, I don't know, gem, sure, we'll just say gem for now, because that's all I can think of. <laughs> uh, I like to take my jelly bean material and then crank up the ambient on it and uh, get like a, a little bit more of kind of a, a glowy, glowy kind of feel to it. So it's got the, it, it, it's really good for like crystals and stuff like that. It's pretty, uh, you can get a pretty cool effect out of that. But it's just the default jelly bean material cranked with the ambient a little bit. For everything else here, I'm pretty much just using uh, um, uh, the Skin Shade 4 slash uh, the Zebro, Zebro paint. They're pretty much the same thing. Zebro paint's like ever so slightly different. Uh, but I've been working on... Uh, cleaning up a lot of stuff here. There's there's a lot of cleanup that I need to do, as well as the uh, the gemstone here. And I guess the only other model I'll show off here at the end is my my gooby, my goobert. Uh, can you show again how to scale in inches? I absolutely can, and I will do that. Let's open up gooby, and we can maybe scale him. Gooby, where's your ZBrush file? There you are. Uh, so if you guys saw my first stream here, first and second stream here on the Pixelogic ZBrush channel, uh, I worked on this. I have since finished this on my own channel. Uh, he's up in a playlist on my YouTube channel if you guys want to go back and see the see the whole process. I would love to 3D print this guy. Uh, he would be awesome to print. Um, there are just a couple things that would have to change, like the thickness in his whiskers and hair. I would probably just end up removing them completely because they would they would look really stupid if I made them super thick. So uh, he was a lot of fun. Uh, let's look, okay, so scaling, right? We'll look at scaling here. Um, uh, thanks for streaming, first time here from Shane. Shane Olson referral, Ab absolutely. Thanks for stopping by and thanks to, thanks to Shane for the referral. Okay, actually, do I still have SpongeBob? I guess we'll do it with SpongeBob since that's who we were playing with. So for scaling, in ZBrush. I'm going to turn off perspective to make this a little bit easier on us. Right now, um, these are all separate subtools. Uh, great to get finally acquainted with your work. Super fun. And talk to you later. Thank you, Smartest. Thanks for uh, coming by, hanging out. You have a good rest of your day. Um, so, SpongeBob here. We don't have too much time left, so. Get your cues in now while you still can. Uh, so let's talk about scale. I like to use the transpose tool, and I like to use the uh, XYZ size uh, size sliders here that tell you the exact size of your mesh. So if you're thinking of your your 3D objects in a, a, an idea of this is X number of inches, this is X, X number of centimeters, millimeters, feet. Uh, Amer freedom units, whatever, whatever the hell you're you're doing, uh, don't stop, stop, stop thinking of it that way in ZBrush at least. Uh, every software reads um, 3D 3D um, unit distance differently. Like in Maya, I think the default is somebody can correct me if I'm wrong. In Maya, I think it's maybe centimeters. Uh, it, it really doesn't matter uh, because when you export uh, an object. It doesn't read it as inches or feet or, or, or millimeters or centimeters. It reads it as just a value. Uh, for, for a lot of data, that is the case. For OBJs, that is absolutely the, the case. For vermal files, that is the case. Uh, for STLs, I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, so what do we got here? We got our X, Y, and Z slider telling us our size in here. And these are just, you know, values. That's, that's what you need to start kind of thinking of them as. But you do want to make sure that you're... Your export scale here is always set to one. Uh, that's very important. Uh, by changing this, you actually, you know, if you set that to two, and if I were to export this, it would be double of all of these, uh, these size values here. So let's set that back to one. Ooh, let it finish quick saving. We got a bunch of stuff open, so it's probably gonna take a minute. Plus, I have uh, my undo history turned on, I think. So it's probably freaking out on us. We will, we will kill that file undo history. 
Uh, so we'll set that back to one. And we have our transpose line. And when you draw out your transpose line, what's awesome about the transpose line? A lot of things are awesome about it, but one of the one thing in particular up here, it will show your units. So look up here in the top left hand corner. As I dra uh, drag this out, we can make it about one units long. We can make it two units long around there. But that's not very exact. Let's say we want to make it exact. Uh, what we can do is we'll just grab a proxy mesh. I'll duplicate that, and then I'll come down into initialize with uh, one one one. You can you know set these to whatever you want. One 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 is just going to be when I click on Q cube. It's going to make a perfect cube, a perfectly six sided cube here. And then I can just come in here and set all my X Y Z sizes to about one, and that'll update that. So this is now one unit. Uh, in, uh, in all dimensions, uh, right? One unit cube. Uh, another thing that's awesome about the transpose line is that it snaps to vertices. So that diagonal there is 1.4141 uh, 41, 41 units. From this vertice to this vertice is one unit. And you can snap to any of these verts. A thing that I have done in the past when working on uh, stuff that would be articulated, uh, we'll set that to one and that's a two, is with a cylinder because uh, you have the ability to snap to vertices with the transpose line. You can use a cylinder or a sphere, snap to the center of that sphere if you're doing a rotate that way to rotate perfectly around that object's pivot point. Or you can snap to the vertice of the cylinder here and rotate perfectly around that pivot point. So that's a little trick that I do for working on stuff that has uh, rotational uh, data associated with it. Uh, so if, a, if a, like a toy or something's going to have an arm that needs to rotate within a certain range, it's a good way to do that. Uh, I'm trying that Goofy. Where did you get that Goofy reference? Uh, yes, this is by... Uh, oh, where'd we go? Uh, this con the original 2D concept is by... Uh, let, let's make sure I have it right. Just to make sure I'm not given incorrect information here. Uh, Gooby is by at vertical draws. So here's the original 2D concept, and there's uh, what my finished 3D uh, figure looked like with uh, some rendering and junk. But yeah, he's uh, really cool, really cool, uh, really cool work by at vertical draws. She has some, she has like a Mickey Mouse that she did in a similar style that's really cool. Okay, back here. So cube. That's how we can make uh, something of a perfect size. We can use our our size settings, we can also snap to vertices, that's all very handy. But now we got our SpongeBob here, and I wanna make my SpongeBob, let's say, I wanna make my SpongeBob uh, two inches tall, right? So let's, we have to go ahead and decide that these units that we're working with represent some kind of measurement later on so we don't go insane. So I'm just gonna say that my units are inches in ZBrush. So what I'm going to do is go into We'll get rid of the movie menu there and go into Transpose Master and click on T-Pose Mesh. And from there, what you can do is mess with your size settings, size sliders, and scale everything at once. And then we can T-Pose it back and we'll uh, apply that to all of our subtools here. So we'll just go down into our size here. If we modify just the Y setting, it will squash it. So we have to modify uh, everything at once. Let's get rid of that ugly white border. So size, we'll set this to two, but you'll see that uh, our max dimension is actually the Z, so that's depth, and that's because of our, <laughs> that's actually because of our nose here. So if I uh, draw that out to about where the nose is from the back, that's about you know close to two units. Uh, so I actually, from doing this earlier, it was like 1.88 or so to, uh, oh no, that was to make it about 1.5 inches tall. So I don't know, maybe it's like 1.95 or, wait, so two, okay, that needs to be larger. So 2.5, and then you can like finagle with this, scaling this if you want to do that, or instead you can, you know, actually center your pivot point you can do it this way you can also scale this a little bit easier in some other applications if you want to do it that way or if you want to uh, set your transpose line and actually 
edit your scale, you can actually edit your scale to uh, get that to be a super exact reading as well. I don't like messing with the scale here though, uh, just because it makes measuring stuff in ZBrush, it makes all your numbers a little bit funky, a little bit different in some areas. Your transpose line will update correctly, but your size sliders will remain the same. Uh, so I like to keep everything uh, within the same area. And then after you're done, you just click on uh, T-Pose Subtools, and that'll cascade all those changes back to uh, all your subtools. So all that should be taken place. And then after that, you go through uh, the whole process of setting up for printing, which we covered earlier. Can you show how you bumped up the toy plastic material? Um, yeah, that was not the toy plastic material. That was the, that was the jelly bean material. Yeah, that should take five seconds. So in our witch, here's what the, uh, the toy plastic material would look like up there. So a little bit more uniform. This is the jelly bean material. So I've selected the jelly bean material. I've gone into the material palette and I've gone into modifiers and just cranked up the ambient color. And you can, you know, crank that as high or as low as you want to make that a little bit more uh, gem, gemstone-ish, gemstone-like. Uh, yeah, so what else? What else we got, gang? Ooh, that's fun. That is, that is terrifying. I'll switch back to my Folygon clay here. I'm gonna delete this. And, let's see. Goofy, Goofy's looking good. But yeah, like I was saying earlier, for 3D printing with this guy, I probably wouldn't even bother with this hair. I would have to be making this this huge if I want, or or you know you could use some like some kind of wire. I don't know, some kind of maybe you could use some pipe cleaners or something for this. Uh, and uh, he, I'm sure you could find some kind of material that you could you could match with that. But I would probably print it, you know. Uh, just just without that and not even worry about it and probably I would probably keep the stand on this to add some stability and probably add something to this uh, this bottom front foot right through here or I would just connect that a little bit better to the stand I would probably just create some geometry that hugged that so that there weren't uh, a ton of areas uh, a ton of uh, problem areas down here Uh, you, you guys are very welcome. Thank you for, uh, thank you for coming and hanging out. Everybody, thank you for coming and hanging out. We got about 15 minutes before I gotta leave. Uh, but unless anybody has any additional questions, I don't know, that seems like a pretty good, pretty good place for us to bounce for the night. I do want to say, uh, uh, one final, I'll give one final, uh, shout out to to my uh, Twitch channel up here, it's somewhere up there. I can't, I don't have the stream pulled up. Let's see, there it is. Right around here, Twitch TV slash Polygon with an underscore at the end of it. I've been streaming in the mornings uh, about every day uh, during the during the week. Uh, so definitely come by. We've, we've been working on this witch gal. We're having a lot of fun with her. Today we added some leaves. Uh, we, what else did we do? We, we worked on our hands a lot. We started to make these these gimpy little sleeves that we got going on, they're pretty bad right now. We'll be probably making those a lot more baggy, playing around with those some more. Um, but yeah, yeah, she's turning out really cool. I'm having a lot of fun working on her. This uh, this gal, she's, ooh, she's freaking out. This uh, this ZBrush file is getting really heavy. I'm getting her this this current session is getting really heavy. I got a lot of stuff going on in here. And I guess the uh, only other thing I'll shout out really quick here at the end is uh, is again is again my Gumroad. Please check it out uh, if you guys are interested in some cool courses, uh, learning how to sculpt some stylized female faces. Uh, essentially, uh, it's real-time footage. I do voiceover going through the whole process, and I put a ton more work into these than I do uh, on anything with the streams or any of the other content that I free content that I produce on my uh, my YouTube channel. I also have mentorships, which is. Uh, the thing that I get asked about the most. And then uh, my most recent base mesh here that I actually uh, made and used uh, is just a few bucks. That's what we made. Uh, we, we actually, if you guys want to see the process of making that and make your own, which would honestly be my recommendation, 
I like to recommend you make your own stuff. But uh, I don't I don't mind you guys helping me out with a few bucks here and there either. Uh, we, we go through the whole process. There's a playlist on my YouTube channel. Uh, it's just g Google Folygon and you'll find it. Uh, but the entire process for making making this gal here from from absolute scratch. We started with a sphere and uh, and went ham and cheese on it. <laughs> uh, Lena, you know this art. Well, that's cool. That's good to hear. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, yeah, guys. Well, thank you again. Uh, for everybody coming and hanging out. Sorry for those that are popping in here at the end. This, uh, the whole, the whole thing for showing off the, uh, the uh, process for 3D printing a uh, an ugly little SpongeBob muffin, and uh, setting that up for full color printing and shapeways. That'll be up on the Pixelogic channel. Definitely go follow the uh, Pixelogic YouTube channel. Follow here on Twitch or Facebook wherever you're watching, and uh, also go check out the official uh, ZBrush Discord channel. There's a ton of really cool people on there. Uh, if you guys are interested in asking the devs questions, they're always on there and super helpful as well. And let's see. Uh, Z, Z Ock, is this correct? Uh, that looks correct to me. I'm going to say yes, that's correct. I'll click it. I'll click it and make sure. I'm probably hosting myself, and this is going to be... Oh, I'm hosting football right now. No, this is an ad. Uh, I am hosting Pixlogic. Yes. Yes, we are. Okay, guys. That's, uh, that's going to be everything. Awesome. Uh, you guys have a great night. And I hope to see you next Tuesday on my stream. I'm going to be streaming at uh, the same time, so 6 p.m. Eastern Standard or 3 Pacific. Uh, or just convert that to minus 5 GMT, I think. I think it's minus 5. Um, or you can come and hang out on my stream tomorrow. I'm going to be streaming tomorrow around uh, noon, noon Eastern time. But uh, yeah, you guys have a great night. And I hope to see you at one of those times. Uh, definitely swing by if you got a chance to say hello. All right, you guys have a great rest of your night. And I will see you next time. See you guys.